All right. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well and enjoying your day. Uh, my name is Kevin Kleppe, and today I want to talk to you guys about 3D printing for accessibility and for fun. Uh, if any of the stuff that I talk about today sounds interesting to you at all, be sure to reach out to me at my contact info that's on this slide. I uh, also want to give a shout out to Nate Dubs of the Visual Arts Department. Uh, he's been a huge help on this project in making this thing happen. Uh, I have some of the contact information for him available as well. So if you like any of the stuff that we talk about today or if any of the stuff that we talk about uh, at the October Tech Fest booth, uh, you can reach out to him as well and he can try and help make that happen. So really quick before we actually get started with the 3D printing stuff, I want to do a really quick overview of what it is I'm going to be talking about. So introducing myself a little bit more and who Nate Dubs is. Uh, what is exactly the project that we are doing and what are we working on? A couple of the examples that we've actually made and handed out to some of the students, staff and faculty of the campus. What do we have available and how can you get involved if, again, any of this kind of stuff sounds interesting to you? So who am I? Uh, my name is Kevin Kleppe. I'm an IT consultant and assistive technologist for the campus. Uh, my job, I basically describe it as 50% IT nerd stuff. So I do all of your typical help desk stuff, solve problems with your computers, install programs, get them working properly, um, anything that you might expect from the technology support center. And then the other 50% of my job is the same thing, but for assistive technology stuff. So I'm not just helping you make sure that your email is coming through and making sure that you can actually see and read your email as well. So installing screen readers, hey, there's my camera, uh, installing screen readers, making sure magnification features work, setting up dark theme modes for folks uh, during quarantine. That was like the biggest request that I was getting. Uh, we were all sitting in front of our computer like 12 hours a day and people were just, you know, going crazy looking at their computer because everything was bright white. Uh, well, there's a lot of really cool dark theme options that you can enable on your phone, on your computer, on different websites. There's an amazing extension called Dark Reader if you're interested that's free that you can install to your browser as well and it'll automatically turn all of your websites that you go to into a dark themed. So um, shout out to that. That's a really awesome program. Uh, and in the last couple of uh, months, one of my recent interests has been looking into the overlap between 3D printing and assistive technology. 3D printing is like an objectively cool thing. It's something that is, one, you can just, whatever your idea is that you want to make, you can actually just make that thing a reality. You just have to figure out, how do I tell this computer to tell this 3D printer to make this thing into a physical object? And over the last couple of months, one of the things I've been thinking to myself is how can we use this not just for making, you know, Star Wars stuff or Marvel stuff, how can we use this actually for assistive technology to help out individuals with disabilities. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that today. If you're interested in any of the stuff, give a shout out to me and I can show you some of the things that we have. We can also work with you on anything that you have an idea about. We are also located in the file library wedge if you want to stop by and see any of the things that we have in person. Um, also, shout out to Nate Dubs, who unfortunately won't be joining us today. He's feeling a little bit under the weather uh, this morning, so he's resting up and getting better. Uh, but he's also been a huge help in this project as well and making this thing happen. Um, worked in the visual arts department, and he has a job that I think I'm probably the most jealous of on campus. When I first met him, uh, he was showing me, I remember I showed him like my one lowly little 3D printer that I have. I have a Creality Ender 3. Uh, that I was really proud of. And he was like, oh, that's so cool. We have a couple of them in my office as well. And he takes me to this room that's filled with like, no joke, 20 3D printers. And I just remember being very, very jealous. And then he went on to show me his laser engraving machine, his CNC machine, his wood workshop, his ceramics workshop. So he basically just has a bunch of like playgrounds that are like his job. Um, and he gets to just do this for a living. Uh, so one, he's an awesome dude. Very, very creative. Very, very cool. Um, and he has the job that I am the most jealous of uh, on campus. So shout out him and his team for helping me out with this. Again, if any of this stuff sounds cool to you, uh, reach out to him. I have some of his contact info on the bottom of this slide as well. So what is it that we're working on exactly? Uh, we are trying to figure out how can we use 3D printing for accessibility. 3D printing has um, always been this thing that I've been just kind of like kind of obsessed about. I've, I've always wanted to figure out how can we use it? How can we get our hands on one of these things? How can we actually use these things to make cool stuff? And then when I started getting, when I started this job in assistive technology and assistive technologists, 
I started to think to myself, how can we actually use it to help out individuals with disabilities? Um, back when I first started getting into this, 3D printers were just these, like, you have to have, you know, a lot of money to get into this. You have to have a lot of time to get into this. You have to know someone. You have to have someone, like, actually show you how to use any of this software and fix any of these things. Uh, in the last couple of years, 3D printing has come down a lot in price, and it's also come down a lot in entry level. Uh, the very first 3D printer I ever got was a Q Pro Duo that I actually inherited from one of my other coworkers, uh, and it was given to me. And this thing was at the time in 2015, um, like a top of the line, like no expense spared, like prosumer level 3D printer. Uh, and it was a $3,000 printer, and this thing sucked. Used proprietary software, proprietary tools, proprietary filament um, that is not even available anymore. It's not even being made. And I just remember like working day and night to try and make this thing like actually viable. And then I remember thinking to myself, well, what does a more modern 3D printer look like? And how does that work? Because this thing was made in 2015. What is a like modern day made in the last couple of years? 3D printer actually look like. And I got a Creality Ender 3 that is way better, uh, prints faster, better detail, uses open source software and filament, and was $180 off of Amazon and shipped to me in about two days. So one, it's come down a ton in price in the last couple of years. It's a lot more affordable. Students can get involved with this. Um, this is great for getting uh, high school kids and like freshmen involved with like just figuring out how do we make 3D models into actual physical life um objects and it's just become a lot easier to get into and now we can actually start to think how can we start to mass produce objects that are not just cool but also uh helpful for individuals for getting their everyday stuff done um and i'm going to be talking a little bit about some of those specific objects today and again huge shout out to nate dubs and his team in the va uh for helping us out with this project and letting us borrow some of his equipment so uh, one of the things that I'm going to be talking about first, and probably the thing that I'm the most proud of, is some of our 3D printed tactile maps. So uh, this campus is tough to navigate. I've been working here for about five years now, and I remember actually a couple of weeks ago, someone asked me where the FO office was, and I was genuinely stumped. I had no clue where that was, and turned out it's like a two-minute walk from my office, but I've never actually been there before. Um, so I just like couldn't help them out. I had to like look on the CSUSB map and like point it out to them that way. Um, imagine what it's like if for someone like me, and I'm imagining some of the folks in this Zoom call, if it's that easy for us to get lost and not know where something is, imagine what it's like to be a freshman on this campus. And then imagine what it's like to be a freshman on this campus, living in the dorms, low vision and or blind living in the dorms as well. That's a really bad recipe for getting lost easily and not knowing where all the buildings are and uh actually had a user who was in that exact scenario earlier this year um living in the dorms awesome guy um really hard working really cool to work with but he was just having a really hard time trying to figure out where any of the buildings are in context to one another so one of the things that he came to me for was he asked me is there any way for us to make a custom 3d printed braille map for any of the buildings or any of the campus maps uh, to make it a little bit easier to navigate around. And at the time, I remember, well, you know, I don't really know how to do this, but let me look and see if there's a workflow that's available. Um, and after a lot of trial and error, uh, we figured out a way to make a 3D printed tactile map of the campus, not just of the campus, but we can actually zoom in as much as we want or zoom out as much as we want. Uh, for the campus map as well. So in the right side of the screen, you can see uh, actually the one that I put in his hands. Um, this is the one that I actually got to put in his hands, be like, what does this look like to you? And how does it work? And it was actually one of the coolest moments of my career that I've had so far, putting this thing in his hands and seeing him actually work his way along the pathways of this map and say to himself, Oh, that's where Jack Brown is. I didn't know that. Oh, there's a pathway in between these two buildings. I didn't know that either. To see this happen in real time, to see someone actually learn like where all the buildings are, that's something, uh, one, I'll never forget, but two, like it's something that you kind of like take for granted because uh, we can just go onto the CSUSB maps uh, and just like look up, you know, where such and such office is. Not everyone has that option. 
uh, we can make these kind of maps for these kind of individuals uh, to make just a very important part of their lives just a little bit easier. And then we also have a QR code uh, that is associated with this map as well uh, that gives descriptions of all the campus buildings as well. So as of right now, for example, on the Fowl Library, that is Braille for PL. Well, if you're you know tracing this thing and putting your hands on it, PL doesn't really mean a whole lot. Well, a student can scan the QR code, and when we first give it to the student, we work with them, we explain how it works, we explain what's on the QR code, scan the QR code, and you can scan it right now, actually, if you're interested. Um, takes them to a website that describes all the different Braille markings and what they mean. So JB is Jack Brown, computer science, computer engineering is located here, cybersecurity is on the third floor, so on and so forth. So they're not just getting a context of where all the buildings are, they're actually getting a context of uh, what's inside those buildings as well. So this has been a really awesome project. And uh, one of the things I'll talk a little bit about later is once you actually get figure out how to do these things, you can share the workflow with other people as well. So I did a presentation on this actually at the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference in March. And I actually got to show other people like how to actually make this thing, but for your location, for your campus, for your buildings. And I actually had a couple of folks reach out to me since then, one of which was from the Utah School for the Blind, uh, asking how do we do this but for our campus. So again, one of the really cool things about this whole process and workflow is not just figuring out how to make these things, but once you actually figure out how to make them, you can share that process with other people. So again, this is just a really cool thing that we've been able to work on and make happen. And one of the things that we're actually try trying to work on now is how do we do this but for individual floor plans so okay cool you can get to the building but now like once you're actually in the building on the first floor where do you go from uh here so we're actually trying to figure out how do we take some of the pdfs that we have of the blueprints of the individual campus buildings and turn them into something similar like this so we've got kind of a workflow working now uh, but in the next year or no we should have it like hammered out and good to go we should be able to get uh, individual floor plans of all the buildings. So that way, if a student gets to, you know, whatever, like University Hall, they actually know where the SSD office is or where the information booth is, because we have the same kind of tactile map available to them, uh, kind of like this. One of the other things that we've been working on are tactile models. So a lot of the lessons that are learned in classes, biology, chemistry, physics, whatever, they're taught through graphs and images that are, are in the books. And if you're a sighted individual, these are great tools and resources because you can just look at something and go, oh, okay, that's what a double DNA helix looks like, or that's what you know this uh, really famous structure looks like. But if you're blind or low vision, you have no idea what those things actually are. You can't read a graph, you can't look at an image. Uh, and a lot of these classes, unfortunately, don't really have any kind of an equivalent that can be used to explain the same kind of context to an individual that might be low vision or blind. They can learn about like what a double, what a DNA uh, molecule is, uh, and they can learn about what a, a neuron is of the brain, which is what you see on top right. Um, but they still don't have the same kind of context and understanding as everybody else because they don't actually know what this thing even looks like. Well, again, with 3D printing, we can, one, make custom tactile models of all of these objects, print it out, put it in the hands of the student, put a QR code on it, and they can start to learn, oh, that's where the axon terminal is, and that's what it does. Oh, that's what the Golgi body is, and that's where it's actually located in the cell, and that's what it does in the context of this entire thing. Um, and if you look at the bottom right, that is, if you recognize it, that is actually the mountain range that's behind us. So um, I actually had a user that came to me a couple months ago and they were low vision and they said to me, you know, like, I've heard that we have these really big, beautiful mountains, but like, I just have no idea what they actually like look like or like what the size of them is. Um, there are, again, just a ton of really cool open source tools out there that actually let you grab the elevation height and data of basically anywhere on the planet uh, and let you print out any location that you might want. So if you want the mountain ranges of Everest, you can do that. If you want to grab the Grand Canyon data, you can do that. So I printed this thing out and I put it in the student's hands and I said to them, these two little hillsides that you see here on the bottom left, our campus fits perfectly in between those things and it's shorter than both of them. And then you have this huge mountain range that's behind us. 
and I just remember seeing them like start to understand just how gigantic these things actually are. Like there's a reason why the mountain range is part of our campus logo because it's this huge structure um, that's behind us. And uh, like you, you kind of lose context of just how big these things kind of are because they're just like prevalent all the time. It's not until you actually see kind of like from this perspective, like, oh, okay, it's that big and it's that wide. Like this isn't even like the whole thing. Um, so we can print out um, as something as small as a neuron of the brain. We can print out something that's as big as a mountain range. Uh, we currently have a list of different things that are available to be made. That's about a hundred plus models along. Uh, and we can print um, basically any geographical information on the planet. I've actually asked some of my student assistants, like just find a random place on the planet that you've always like wanted to go to uh, and just like get the data using this workflow that I'll share with you. And like, we can actually like make this thing into a like physical object. And I think that would be really cool to see. Uh, so I've had student assistants do the Washington mountain ranges. I've had student assistants do uh, Mount Fuji in Japan. I've had student assistants do the Grand Canyon. Um, this is cool stuff to do. This is really good way to get students involved with like making things and like trying to think on their feet and like figure out like how to actually make this thing happen. Um, if any of this stuff sounds interesting to you, re can reach out to us and yeah, let's collaborate. Let's make something happen. And then uh, one of the other things that we've been working on are trying to make tools and also working on photogrammetry tools, something like a phone holder. So if you come to my office in my lab on the right of the bottom picture, you can see one of our uh, hippo phone holders. Um, students are on their phones all the time. Um, they have to be. That's how they watch uh, class lectures. It's how they do uh, group projects. It's how they watch tutorials on YouTube. Like it's not because they're just talking to their friends all the time. They are, but they're also getting a lot of work done through their phones as well but they're always holding their phones in their hand. Like they're always propping their phones up on a backpack or something. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, can we just make something for them that'll hold their phone for them? And like, they can free up both of their hands, like make it easier to take notes or to get other things done. And we can, and we started making these things. And when I tell you, like, we can't keep these things on the shelves, like I'll put out five of these things at the front of my lab and a little sign that says like free phone holder, please take they are gone the next day. Um, I remember I made 20 of these things for the first day of October Tech Fest yesterday. And I went back to my office to like handle an email really quick. And I came back out and we were down to like three. So students love these things. One, because they're if, like, uh, they're all, they're cute. Like one, well, one's a little cute little hippo. And then the other one that we have uh, is a cute little pig guy that you can also pick up if you come to the second day October Tech Fest booth that we're gonna have. Um, but the one that's on the left as well, that's also something that's been a lot of fun to work on because we can take any logo or model or icon and put it onto a 3D printed plastic phone holder as well. So um, I've put the Coyote radio logo on there. I've put um, logos for the rec center on here. I've done all kinds of things that are uh, associated with the campus and put that logo onto a 3D printed phone holder. So if you have something that you want to market or if you have a department that you want to market, and you want to put something personal and that's specific to what you and your team do, we can do that. Again, just reach out to us and let us know. Um, and the other thing that's been a lot of fun is uh, photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is basically just taking a ton of photos, stitching them together in a program like Reality Capture and trying to make a 3D model of that thing. So in the top right, you can see that's Wild Song. Uh, that is the coyote statue that's in front of the SMSU. We can make this thing. Like I took a bunch of photos of this thing put it into a program and made a 3D model with it and printed it out with like 50 cents worth of material. So we can mass produce these things. We can spray paint them whatever color we want and we can put any other additional objects on these things. So uh, in my office, I have the same thing, but I put a pair of uh, Ray-Bans on the guy, which I thought was a lot of fun. So um, again, if you have something that you wanna have marketed or you wanna have uh, something like Wild Song available to you, like you just gotta reach out to us and let us know. So why are we working on all this stuff? Uh, one, because it's fun. Two, because it's become a lot easier to get into in the last couple of years in terms of price and like entry level. Um, but these things that we're making, they just make a 
better overall quality of life for students, a better understanding of the material that they're going through for their classes. The image that you see on the right here, this is a zipper tag. This is something that you could put on a zipper with a zip tie and uh, make it so that instead of having to grab and pinch a zipper to open up a backpack, you just have to hook your finger through and pull it through with that. I had a user who has cerebral palsy and something as small as opening up the zipper for his lunch bag is just a huge pain in the butt for him because he doesn't have the consistency in hand and finger strength to grab and pinch a zipper and actually pull the thing open. I printed this thing out for him on the spot one day and I put it on the zipper for his lunch bag um, with a zip tie. And I went from seeing him struggle to open this thing up uh, like an hour before to putting this thing on opens it up no problem whatsoever. Now that's a small thing to be able to open up your book bag or your lunch bag a little bit more easily, but to do this more easily every single day um, can just make a huge difference in your life. Um, this project has also been great for breaking down the silos. Nate, again, has been awesome to work with um, and we can share all these things freely. And then how can you get involved? Give us a shout out, let us know what you wanna have made. Talk to us in the ATC Center, we are in PL 1109. Innovation Lab, while they are currently closed, they're also awesome to work with. They are located across from the elevators on the first floor of the library. And the Visual Arts team, the Deaf Lab, talk to Nate Doves, he's awesome. Um, and then as a final slide, I'll have some of my favorite things I've made. Uh, Coyote statue with some Ray-Bans put on it, an F-4 Phantom, which is actually something my dad flew for about 20 years in the Air Force. Uh, and then the star of the show, everyone's favorite, baby group, but my student assistant painted it and it looks just amazing. It looks like something you would buy in a store. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your list for listening to me. And yeah, stop by our booth later and check out what we have in person.